evening, everybody. Um, thanks for coming along. Uh, my name's Richard Dennis. Uh, I'm the director of the Australia Institute. And if you haven't been to politics in the pub before, thank you uh, very much for coming along. Uh, we get together here about once a month uh, to uh, to hear from great speakers uh, like tonight. Where we'll be hearing from Father Frank Brennan, who I'll introduce more fully in a minute. But the the structure of the evening, again, if you haven't come along before, is uh, Frank will talk for half an hour or so, and then after that we'll go. We'll take questions up until uh, uh, seven o'clock, and then of course you're free to stick around and uh, talk to each other or to Frank if he's around. And uh, I, I hear the schnitzel downstairs is quite good as well. And the bar's obviously open at the back. So the whole idea of politics in the pub is to create a forum where people can come and uh, think about important topics and then talk to uh, uh, talk to each other about them. So. Uh, thank you very much for coming along and uh, if you want to know about future events uh, there's usually a clipboard floating around somewhere you can put your email address on but I can tell you now that the um, uh, the next topic uh, oh actually I'm speaking at the next one uh, <laughs> is um, are baby boomers stealing Gen, stealing Gen Y's future uh, and uh, myself uh, myself and a woman called Marsha Keegan uh, who's uh, involved with the Young Economist Network will be uh, will be debating that topic, uh, or perhaps agreeing uh, on that topic. Uh, anyway, the date for that one is Wednesday, the 18th of July. Uh, always uh, six till seven uh, here. So, uh, so that's the next one. But um, uh, allow me now uh, to introduce uh, Father Frank Brennan, uh, whose topic is uh, Australia's 20-year search for a coherent workable and moral asylum policy and while we planned this event a little while ago uh, I don't think we could have got a, a worse or a better day uh, to, to start um, or to have this conversation. Uh, so uh, Father Frank Brennan AO uh, is a Jesuit priest, a lawyer and a human rights advocate. He's written extensively on the rights of refugees and asylum seekers uh, and he's been a harsh critic of the policy of mandatory detention in Australia. Uh, Father Brennan is also an adjunct fellow at the Australian National University and a professor of law at the Australian Catholic University. So uh, please join me in welcoming Father Frank Brennan. Good evening and great to be with you. I have a written paper but I'm not going to read it. I think it's available on the website of the Institute and it's also available on the Eureka Street site. Just to give a word of background about myself, as a Jesuit priest and a lawyer, I was directing our Jesuit refugee service in East Timor in 2001. So I was on the streets of Dili the night the so-called Tampa incident occurred. And it was one of those times when I was rather shocked as an Australian in a visiting place like East Timor. I was told, and it was true, that the Australian government then, particularly Mr Downer, had approached people like Ramos Horta and said, uh, we've got a boatload of people, 433 of them, and we don't know what to do with them, and we'd like you to take them. Horta and others of the East Timor administration, generous as they are, were basically putting the argument and saying, well, Australia's been very generous to us in our hour of need, maybe we should reciprocate. It just happened that the head of the UN there at the time was Sergio de Mello who had been the deputy head of UNHCR. De Mello was furious and said it just wasn't on. So that's why the people from the Tampa didn't go to East Timor, thank God, and it's why they did end up going to Nauru. When I returned to Australia, I received a phone call and was asked whether I would visit the Woomera Detention Centre. And so I started over the next two years visiting there and Baxter each month. And I had good access and I met every two months with Philip Ruddick. And there was a very extensive file of correspondence between Ruddick and myself. And in 2003 I published a book called Tampering with Asylum and I did a new issue of it in 2007. So I acknowledge that we're still looking for a coherent, workable and moral refugee policy. And I concede that I, as a Catholic priest, probably put more emphasis on the moral than some other people would. But I'm pragmatic enough to say that what we do need is something which is workable and which is principled. And I think we're still a long way from that. So let me set out what I see as some of the principles. 
we are a signatory to the Refugee Convention and we are also a net migration country. Even if we were not a net migration country, we would be obliged to offer asylum to those who presented within our jurisdiction seeking that asylum. Uh, but as we're a net migration country, we've got some room to move which some other countries do not have. I think it's quite proper that our governments on both sides of the political fence since 2001 have said that we will have a strict quota for the humanitarian component of our migration program each year. Prior to 2001, our offshore humanitarian processing regime would not be affected by the number of people who successfully applied onshore for refugee status. But since 2001, it has to be acknowledged that everyone who succeeds onshore in getting a permanent protection visa, that's one less place for people offshore. So in terms of the moral calculus, one thing that has to be held in tension is yes, for every person who comes by boat or by plane and successfully applies for refugee status, one less place for those who are the neediest, as Mr Ruddick used to always refer to the Kakuma camp, those who can't afford a bus fare, those who could never access a people smuggler, or those in other humanitarian need. So that is part of the moral calculus which is necessary. Another part of the moral calculus is dealing equitably with those who arrive by plane and those who arrive by boat. As John Menadieu often emphasises, he having been a secretary of the Immigration Department at one stage, if you look at the stats over the last 10 years, most Australians are never aware of this, 70% of the people who have successfully applied for refugee status onshore did not come by boat, they came by plane. And so, even if you look at the figures over the last two and a half years, when we've had a blowout of the number of people arriving by boat, those seeking protection, the majority of them are still those who arrive by plane. So, the other question in terms of equity is how should you treat the people who arrive by boat compared with those who arrive by plane? I have no problems with saying that you hold people who come by boat, particularly if they not arrive with adequate documentation, and obviously they do not arrive with a visa, so you are entitled to hold them in detention for the purposes of establishing identity, health and security issues. Or to put it another way, hold them in detention until they are in an equivalent type position as the person who arrived by plane with a visa. Now in terms of those who arrive by plane with a visa, there are two classes. There's one very small class, which are those who you might say are scrupulously honest. That is, they arrived on a family or tourist or business visa, and after arrival in Australia, circumstances changed back home, and then they applied for asylum. But the second class is the larger class, and they're all human like most of us. That is, they don't tell the whole truth when they apply for their tourist visa to arrive in Australia. And they get here and then they say, oh, and by the way, I'm here seeking asylum. Now the question is, equitably, how should we treat the person on the boat, who whatever else you might say against them, they're scrupulously honest in this sense, they turn up saying, I'm a refugee and I want asylum. How should they be treated compared with the person who arrives by plane without having made the full declaration. So there are some of the moral quandaries that confront us in trying to get the balance right between these conflicting groups. We here in Australia are, as you know, at the end of the earth. And the people who flee this way in recent times have come from places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Sri Lanka. We are not the country next door. And the whole theory of the Refugee Convention, it was posited post-World War II on the idea 
that you had to offer protection, solace, to the person who was engaged in direct flight. And a distinction was long drawn between people engaged in direct flight who turned up breathless on your border and said, I need protection, over against the person who engaged in what was called secondary movement. That is, the person fled from country A into country B, they could there avail themselves of an adequate degree of protection, but then they said, ah, I would like to seek a more benign migration outcome and flee to country C. We are country C often, why? Not only because we offer protection, but we are a quite pleasant first world country in which to live. Since 2001, governments on both sides of the political fence have decided routinely that those who come through Malaysia and Indonesia will no longer be treated as if they are engaged in direct flight, if they have come from places like Iraq, Afghanistan. Prior to 2001, they were so treated as if they were engaged in direct flight. Philip Ruddick always said to do-gooders like myself, and we're always called do-gooders, do-gooders like myself, if ever we had a group who arrived in direct flight, of course we'd put out the welcome mat and we'd treat them exactly the same as the people who arrived by plane. Well, you might remember, we did have one small boatload who arrived <coughs> from Papua uh, in direct flight, claiming persecution by Indonesia, and what happened? They were treated in exactly the same way as the rest of the boat people. So, the question has been, given that we no longer presume people are engaged in direct flight, what is an appropriate, what's a workable, what's an ethical way of dealing with people who are coming through Malaysia or through Indonesia? Neither country is a signatory to the Refugee Convention. In Indonesia, we have long-term relationships, not only with the Indonesian government, but with IOM and with UNHCR, to assist with the accommodation of people who are seeking asylum and to assist with the processing of their claims. One of the things which is passing strange about Indonesia is the number of people which are said to be of concern to UNHCR. UNHCR just last week published their global trends for 2011. And to give you an idea of the people of concern in Indonesia compared with elsewhere. In Indonesia, UNHCR says there are 4,239 persons of concern. Meanwhile, in Malaysia, there are 217,618. Another lesson to learn from these figures is, as I've said, we are a net migration country. Another fact which is relevant and something which we can pat ourselves on the back about is that we are in the top three, namely United States, Canada and Australia, who make places available particularly for those who are assessed by UNHCR as being refugees and who are in need of resettlement and who cannot afford a people smuggler or can't get anywhere near a boat. Some would say, well, in order to maintain that quota, we should therefore try and lock out everybody who comes. But if you look at the UNHCR figures, you find that in Australia, I think the figure is about 26,000 people with 28,676 persons of concern to UNHCR in Australia. Whereas if you look at the figures in Canada, 206,735, and in the United States, 276,484. So the other two countries which are up there with us in playing a role in assisting UNHCR have ten times the number of people within their borders who are of concern to UNHCR than we do. Part the problem for us as Australians 
is that we have the attitude, because we're an island nation continent, that we somehow should be able to maintain hermetically sealed borders. I make no apology for saying that the only people who really think you can maintain hermetically sealed borders in a globalised 21st century world are those who are either lunatics or racists. Now, if you're not a lunatic or a racist, you accept that there will be a porous border situation. There is a ready solution if you wanted to have more hermetically sealed borders in Australia. You could render us a truly island nation continent. We could relinquish sovereignty of those islands like Christmas Island, which are closer to Indonesia than they are to Australia. That would help to solve a lot of the problems in terms of it would be much less attractive for people to head by boat for Java down this direction if those places were not part of the Australian jurisdiction. But I haven't heard anyone putting that forward. The other point to note is compared with major Western European countries, our borders are almost hermetically sealed. Let me just quote to you from UNHCR figures last week on the persons of concern in Denmark, 18,000, Greece, 45,000, Netherlands, 87,000, France, 260,000, United Kingdom, 208,000, and Germany, 658,000. So that being the case, that's why I say I make no apology for those who say that you are simply a romantic if you're not putting forward a solution which would render hermetically sealed borders. Hermetically sealed borders are something of the age of pre-European settlement in Australia. They have no place in 21st century Australia. So then, what is the appropriate way to proceed at the moment and what's on offer? I always read closely Paul Kelly in The Australian and he this morning pointed out that any of us who are, remain in favour of onshore processing have to admit that the present crisis destroys the moral superiority once claimed by opponents of offshore processing. He, like most commentators, sees it as a choice between offshore processing and onshore processing. I think that's a false dichotomy. There are four options that need to be considered. The first is offshore processing in the sense of Nauru and the Pacific Solution. Offshore processing is where a country like Australia avails itself of the benefit that it has poor indigent island neighbours and says we can do a deal with you where we want to bring our people who turn up on our shores and have them processed in your area of the world. <coughs> and this is what we had with Nauru in 2001 and it's presently what Tony Abbott has on the table for a resolution of the issue. What was critical in 2001 was John Howard was a Prime Minister who was seen, he was seen to be a man of firm convictions and a man of his word. And thus, when he said, you will never get to Australia, that was believed. Well, roll the tape forward. Yes, with the weight that went on, 30% of people on Nauru decided we've had enough of this, and they went home. But of those who stayed and were proved to be refugees, most of them ended up in Australia or New Zealand, except for a few who had relatives in Norway or Sweden. Now, as I often say, if you're in Hazara, you don't watch all that much rugby world football, and you're not much worried about whether or not you end up on one side of the Tasman or the other. And so Australia and New Zealand translate as the same thing. The question now is, would the so-called Abbott solution of moving people to Nauru for processing, would that have the same deterrent effect? Well, don't listen to me. Everyone, including Andrew Metcalf, who worked in Howard's office, was head of the immigration department at the time of the last government, has told the parliament unequivocally there is no way that bluff can work second time around. Namely, the people smugglers can tell people in Indonesia, look, it doesn't matter what the Australian politicians say, if you sit it out, 
you will end up in Australia or New Zealand. So just sit it out. So that's so-called offshore processing. At the moment, I think a category mistake is being made in the talk about the Malaysia solution in that it also is said to be offshore processing. But I think Paul Kelly did get it right this morning when he described Malaysia as a virtual towback with no hope of an Australian visa. What is imperative with the Malaysia solution is this. Any people we take to Malaysia will be placed on the end of a queue which is 90,000 long. There are 90,000 people claiming asylum in Malaysia. That's why it is said quite accurately by this government that Malaysia could well work as a deterrent. Not because you will be processed offshore, but because you will never be processed. So I say full marks to the Malaysia solution in terms of workability, namely in deterring boats from coming. But in terms of ethical compliance with obligations under the Refugee Convention, I'm sorry, I give it naught out of ten. And as I have said about the Malaysia solution constantly, the one test case you need to envisage is that of the unaccompanied minor who arrives on a boat. Mr Bowen, what are you going to do with that child? Does that child get sent to Malaysia? In which case... The whole regime is immoral. If you don't send the child to Malaysia, then I'm sorry, it's unworkable. Because if the child stays in Australia, the clear signal sent to the people smugglers is send the kids. Because sending the kids, you'll be sure they're not sent to Malaysia, but they can end up in Australia and you can bring on the rest of the family. So then the question is, well, do you look at a combination of... Malaysia and Nauru, where what you do is you send most of your first 800 who arrive to Malaysia to the end of the queue, where to quote Mr Kelly again, they will have no hope of an Australian visa, but with those who are vulnerable you send them to Nauru, where you then process them, and as you did previously under the Nauru option, you then, when you find them to be refugees, ultimately resettle them in Australia or New Zealand. So, that's option three. I rather describe it not as offshore processing, but offshore dumping. <laughs> offshore dumping in the sense that we say, yes, we are a signatory to the Refugee Convention, but for the foreseeable future, anyone who arrives by boat, we will not accord to them the usual suite of protections which we would accord being a signatory to the Refugee Convention. We will send them to a country where they will be sent to the end of a queue, where they will not be accorded those privileges and conveniences. The final option, number four, is what I call um, returning people to Indonesia and looking at regional resettlement. Ultimately, I think this is the only thing that can work, but it does require much more cooperation between Australia and Indonesia than has been there to date, and it requires much more involvement by UNHCR in Indonesia. Let me share with you. I, simply reading my books, I sit down and I read those statistics from the UNHCR uh, material circulated last week and find that there are hundreds of thousands of people of concern in all of those other countries and 4,000 in Indonesia. So I ask you and HCR, what's the explanation? And I'm told there is no explanation I can be given. All I can conclude is that, as I put it as politely and benignly as possible, you and HCR at the moment has a very light touch in Indonesia. And it's largely funded by assistance from Australia. But I would think there are far more than 4,000 people of concern in Java, but they're just not there on the UNHCR books. We are never going to get to a truly regional solution or even an Australian answer until we distinguish out this critical thing. <coughs> 
Human nature being what it is, we have to acknowledge that those people heading to Australia by boat, yes, many of them want not only protection, they want our lifestyle. They want to live in the best of all possible countries. The only way in the longer term that we will be able to comply with our obligations under the Refugee Convention is to be able to separate out the protection result from the guaranteed migration to Australia result. That means the answer to the so-called Australian problem is regional solutions, namely regional resettlement of people who are in the region seeking refugee protection. By which I mean you have people who are in Indonesia, they get duly processed with assistance from IOM, UNHCR, but then on proof of refugee status, yes, some of them will end up in Australia, some of them will end up in Indonesia, some in Malaysia, some in Vanuatu, some in Nauru. And unless there is that sort of regional response, or unless there is some equivalent action where government separates out guaranteed resettlement in Australia from guaranteed protection, then we have to expect that boats will continue to come. In conclusion, I say that the desire that there be no more boats come, I think, is a desire which can only be expressed by a country which is an island nation continent. I'm constantly bemused when I go to the United States. The most rampant Republicans down there in the southern states, when they hear that the Murdoch press froths at the mouth every time a boat turns up in Australia, because lo and behold, there are people entering without a visa, they say to you, well, it happens across the Mexico border every day before breakfast. So, in terms of seeking a solution which is workable, moral and coherent, I think one of the things we need to do is to redefine the so-called problem. And even some of the most educated people in Australia operate from the premise that we should have hermetically sealed borders. Given we will not have hermetically sealed borders, given that we are a net migration program, and given that we are proud of our commitment to the Refugee Convention, then we have to expect there will be some porous behaviour at our borders, but we have to work in a more regional way if we are to provide any long-term solutions. Thank you. Now, having been watching the parliamentary debate this afternoon, I know there'll be many people who disagree with me, so I feel perfectly free to disagree because I think a forum like this particularly the public angst that is there at the moment, uh, we need all the good ideas we can get. And Tony, I think you're going to facilitate the questions and answers. Yep. Tony Kevin. Hi everybody, I'm, I'm Tony Kevin, some of you might know me. Richard Dennis asked me to fill in for him, we have to go off to an interview, and we've got till 7 o'clock, I understand we've got fairly sharp at 7 on the dot. I'll allow questions or very short comments of you. Down between resettlement and protection. Right. In terms of drilling down between protection and resettlement, someone turns up within your jurisdiction and says, I'm a refugee. Then our obligation under the Refugee Convention is not to refool that person to the place from which they have fled fearing persecution. Now, there is no obligation in the Refugee Convention to give that permanent person permanent residence. You can shop around and find another country to which the person might be relocated. You might even be able to move them back to a country through which they transited, where you say they could have availed themselves of a sufficient degree of protection. What we found in Australia, when we experimented with the so-called temporary protection visa, People who have fled somewhere like Afghanistan or Iraq, okay, you give them a three-year temporary protection visa, 
on the basis that we don't have an obligation to give them permanent settlement here in Australia, but after three years, guess what? Situation back home hasn't changed, and so you simply have to process them again and determine once again that they are refugees requiring protection. In the meantime, you've said to them, you cannot establish yourself here for a permanent existence, and you cannot uh, be reuniting members of your family, and you cannot travel overseas and return to Australia. That is said to be a deterrent for people getting on the boats in the first instance, but what the statistics showed was that yes, some people might have stopped getting on the boats, but the family members who otherwise expected that they would be able to be reunited with those who were on the temporary visa in Australia, they got on the next boat. So it's not that protection necessarily entails permanent settlement in the country which you've reached, but unless you can find another country to which you can direct them or send them back safely to one of the countries through which they fled, then yes, if they've arrived within your jurisdiction, then you are obliged to give them ongoing protection for as long as they are proved to be refugees. genuine question because I don't know the answer but the Refugee Convention was um, 1951 are you happy that I mean so many countries around the world seem to be having issues with um, with the refugee situation or people seeking asylum do you think that the 1951 Refugee Convention should still stand as it is or should we be looking at, I don't know, making it a bit more responsive to needs? Uh, I think if we were drawing up a refugee convention today, it wouldn't be in the terms of the 1951 convention. The question is whether or not the basic provisions there provide a baseline to which you'd want to hold the international community of nations. I think, if I may say, there's been a lot of hypocrisy uttered in our parliament uh, particularly on the Liberal Party side in recent days, about, well, of course, we'd never send anyone to any country except that covered by the Refugee Convention. Well, hang on. Nauru wasn't covered by the Refugee Convention when you set up the Pacific Solution. I think getting away from the sort of legalism of the Refugee Convention, the question more should be, do we have in place arrangements which genuinely provide the sorts of protections which would be accorded by a country if it were faithfully implementing the provisions of the Refugee Convention. I mean, I think it is just crass legalism to say, well, for example, Cambodia and East Timor are signatories of the Refugee Convention, therefore they'd be perfectly appropriate places to send people. Nonsense. They only signed up to it because that was part of the deal of being a new and emerging nation with having to sign up to all the UN covenants and conventions, leaving East Timor to one side, Cambodia, which I know moderately well, I mean, it'd be the last country on earth to which you would say, oh yes, we think that's an appropriate place for people to be dealt with. So, as a legal instrument, uh, it's dated, but its key provisions set down a bottom line, which I think are useful to hold governments to account. But in terms of the debate that's going on in Australia at the moment, it is as spurious for the Liberal Party to say, oh, well, it's got to be one of the 148 countries which is a signatory to the Refugee Convention, as it is for Oakshot to say, well, it's got to be one of the countries which is a signatory to the Bali process. I mean, Afghanistan's a signatory to the Bali process, God help us. Uh, that sort of thing doesn't get you anywhere. Um. Thanks for the talk, it was one of the best sort of presentations of the issues I've seen. Um, but I just wanted to question a little bit that the distinction you made at the start, um, where you talked about the cap um, mm. and the change that happened in 2001. Yes. I didn't realise there was a change there, but you seem to agree with that. But I don't know. like In, in moral that, terms, I don't agree with yeah, it, but I, I think I politically it's unchangeable. But yeah, go on. Because that provides the basis on which a lot of people argue 
you know, um, people who come here um, on shore, sure. you know, are not deserving compared to people who are offshore sure. because, you know, it's an exchange one for one, whereas I think mm. it should be just we take people offshore, a certain amount offshore, and then whoever managed to get here, you know, we process mm. their claims kind of mm. thing. So, um, but yeah, okay, I, see, I see what you're saying, it's not politically doable, but I don't think morally... It's That's good. the approach we took as a country before 2001. Yeah. On both sides of the political fence now, I think there is no prospect of going back on that, particularly as it does provide the linchpin necessary for a moral argument for those who say we've got to be very tough on those who are trying to get here without a visa because we're doing it precisely to make extra spaces available for those who could never get on a boat. And just in terms of general public policy, I mean, it is coherent to say that you have a migration program where you plan the numbers in each quota. But having Isn't said that, that, definition that people who are coming here can't plan that. Yes. I mean, obviously, you put in provisions like a regional solution so sure. that less people come. But mm. by definition, they just yes. like it's porous border, you know. Sure. <laughs> and it was the other point I made, which was that even countries which are not net migration countries, they do have obligations under the Refugee Convention. And they can't just say, oh, no, we won't take you in because we're committed not to having any net migration. Right. Both of you first here, then the back. Thank you for the talk. Um, uh, can you talk a bit about how you talk to other people? Uh, this, I guess, might be an easier crowd to, to win over. But can you reflect upon experiences of talking to mad people, racist, <laughs> 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 party people, and a lot of the punters out there too? Do you mm. pitch it the same sort of way? Mm. Uh, and uh, what are some of the successes and failures you've had talking mm. to people who aren't so many? Mm. <laughs> um, I was at a fabulous event which the Penrith Council put on for Refugee Week. And I deliberately you know, went out to St Mary's in West, West, West Sydney for this event for Refugee Week. And... Um, it, it's amazing, events like that where, I mean, you know that there's some hostility in the crowd, but then, like, a young Sudanese fellow is invited to stand up and tell his story and then to do his rap dancing and song routine. And, I mean, the crowd just melts in front of him. And then the Iranian dancers get up and perform. And you can sense this spirit in the crowd that, you know, we're rather proud that we're the sort of community which can accommodate people like that. In terms of, like, on the talkback radio thing, um, I one thing I find useful, and I've got to do it particularly because I'm a Catholic priest, so therefore, you know, I am a do-gooder, and as you know, all I ever want to do is impose my moral views on everyone else, and <laughs> it's usually about sex and all of that sort of stuff. So you sort of do the self-deprecating thing of, yes, you know, all of that might be true and it might not be, but let's forget about my moral view of the universe. Let's just ask what sort of community we'd like to be part of. And let's ask what sort of threat we think is at work here. And let's do a bit of comparison. Look, I know statistics are terrible, but let's just compare ourselves with some other countries around the world. And the line about, let's just admit, that it's because we're an island nation continent, that's why we have it in our minds that anyone who turns up, that this is going to be the end of civilization as we know it. Sometimes I use the Paul Keating line. Remember that great one you said, uh, you know, when continents were being given out, there weren't a lot of them. And we were a very lucky mob because we were given one to ourselves. So the question is what we're going to do with it. And that in terms of engagement of our responsibilities to the rest of the world and let's face it except for those of us who are aboriginal then you know we've all got a story to tell about how we got here there are some of the techniques sure um, frank i can't uh, quite agree with your fourth uh, option i agree with most of what you say yeah. and i i know you as a as a good yeah. uh, refugee advocate mm. However, I don't think that fourth option of splitting protection and resettlement can really work. Either, well, it's not workable, I think. It's not consistent, I believe, with the convention, uh, and it's, uh, it's not really needed. 
those are the three things I'd say. Not workable because let's say you have people in Indonesia who've got their <coughs> however via Malaysia. Uh, if we have some arrangement with Indonesia and UNHCR that we process their applications there and uh, that we make them available for resettlement. Um, the burden sharing approach, I think, of other nations is unlikely to lead to a lot of them going anywhere but Australia. Secondly, if people are left there with nowhere to go because we refuse to take them, they will not have the same protections that they have under Articles uh, 3 to, you know, 30 something that, uh, that, that the High Court found under our existing legislation they have. Uh, and uh, the final point is I think it's not needed because uh, we have a political problem, as you are obviously saying, but we, and we have a moral problem if we don't actually take the people who, who come here or come close to us. Uh, but we don't have a real problem of taking those numbers uh, if we're talking in terms of protecting people from sinking at sea. Uh, I, I really refer you to Tony's, Tony's views on this, that there are other things we could be doing in terms of rescue, in terms of taking responsibility, responsibility for that. And, of course, in terms of a, another kind of regional arrangement where uh, we do process people overseas. If you like, we try to find their... Uh, than other countries, but we're prepared to take any that can't rapidly go somewhere else. So I, I, I have to draw the line at number four. Sorry I went on too long. No, gentlemen down here, if I could just say something briefly before he comes up. Come up, please. Yes. Um, one of the other issues of course is that we are a country of migration, and none of those, one of the other issues is that we are a country of migration, and we're looking for people. And none of those other countries who'd be involved in the regional solution, with the exception of New Zealand, are countries of migration. So there are there are issues there. But let, let's give it to the next speaker. Um, I, I didn't want to take us too far from the sort of crisis of today, but did some of your comments triggered from mine a thought about the broader um, sort of direction of the world population? We use economic migration in a quite a disparaging way unless you're a skilled labourer or unless you're global capital. And it seems to me in a world where capital is now globalised, labour is starting to globalise. I guess in that context, what do you think is the future of our borders and the borders of nation states and does that place this sort of particular problem in a different context, do you think, in future? <coughs> I think borders will be increasingly porous and I think situations like Europe will be more the situation that we'll expect and um, it will only be, I mean we Australians will come slowly to that conclusion simply because of our geography. Thanks, Frank. I'm not an expert in the area and haven't followed the conversation today in the parliament. Um, but I just wanted to report a conversation that took place in our household a couple of days ago when we had uh, the, the boat was sinking and then uh, people were rescued. And then we heard that um, a number of, of the people who had been rescued had been uh, fast tracked for, for processing on, on, the, on the mainland. And uh, a member of our household said, that's interesting. If there's capacity to fast track people, um, notwithstanding the compassionate emotion that we all had in response to the traumas that they had been through, um, how do you weigh the trauma that they've gone through uh, compared to the trauma of people who've been sitting in refugee camps uh, for decades and say, well, if we've got spare capacity, where should it go? So I don't have an answer, but how do you, how do you apply a, a moral... Uh, uh, a calculus to that situation. Well, I think the answer is with great difficulty, but I would draw this distinction. Any talk of fast tracking, I presume, would only be about releasing people from detention on bridging visas or into so-called community <coughs> detention. 
on the basis they've been through all this hell of a trauma, why keep them in the detention centre at Christmas Island until we've got all the documentation or whatever. I don't think there'd be any fast tracking in terms of the processing of their protection visa application and I don't think there'd be any case for that. Um, now, in terms of your broader question, I think, I mean, the moral calculus on these things in the end is incalculable. Once you've got that nexus between the people presenting at your border and the plight of 35 million people in the world who are uh, refugees or internally displaced or asylum seekers at any one time. Um, so given that you admit that there is that um, incapacity to do a complete moral calculus, you then have to pragmatically weigh up and try and reach some sort of uh, principle to what I call coherent compromise solution. Uh, on the issue of your option four, do you think it would be possible to deal with the, uh, and given that it's an international issue, it would be possible to deal with it internationally in the same way as was done in the 1980s with the Comprehensive Plan of Action? <coughs> it may be, but the, the problem would be that, I mean, We've been dealing with flows which, as you'd know, in recent years, I mean, at some stage we had people coming from China, then we had people from Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Sri Lanka. At least, I mean, the thing with the Comprehensive Plan of Action was they were basically focused on the human overflow at the end of the Vietnam War. So the question would be how do you transpose that to deal with ongoing flows which occur in that the big change now, uh, since the 1970s, and it is in part because of people smugglers and cheaper air flights and all of that, is that people from anywhere in the world, no matter where the conflagration occurs, they'll turn up here. Now, as I say, it's often like nowadays, uh, any conflagration, it's like throwing a stone into a pond. And guess what? The ripples go everywhere, and some of the ripples even end up in Australia. Now, what we've done to date is to say, well, look, because we're at the end of the earth, basically we should be spared all this. No, part of a globalised world, we're not to be spared it, and that's simply now part of the reality of living on this globe. I might just wrap it up with a few words myself, if I may. We've got about six minutes till we got to be out of here. I've just written a book called Reluctant Rescuers and um, I was on Fran Kelly's Radio National at breakfast on Monday morning and you can, you can download that talk from, from the ABC or from other places now. My focus in this book is not so much on the question of what we do with refugees who get here and in fact 97% of those who try to cross the water from Indonesia do make it safely. My focus is on why do the 3% who don't get here sink and who's accountable for those sinkings. Now, the orthodox answer, of course, is people smugglers. And in my book, I've tried to suggest that as a border protection system, we have an accountability <coughs> to, if we have detailed intelligence, which we're collecting on the people who are trying to come here, and we certainly know every time they are trying to come here, we surely have a moral responsibility to try to save their lives in the cases where they get into trouble. I used to think this was a party issue. It's not, of course. We've, we've had more deaths now under Labor than we had under the Coalition. And in fact, that they seem to be coming more often now. We, uh, the last one was six months ago. Then we had another one last week. Now we have another one this week. Um, it's really frightening to wonder whether the increasing rate of deaths at sea might somehow be part of the climate in which politicians are now moralising on all sides in Parliament today as to how we really have to go for offshore processing to save human life. And <laughs> there's a saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Well, all I can say is there is an awful lot of good intentions being expressed in Parliament today. Anyway, if any of you would like to hear any more about these things, come to the launch of my book on, on Thursday of next week, the 5th of July. Um, in paper chain. <laughs>
Frank Brennan will be launching it. I hope, I hope he won't be repeating his talk of tonight. Oh, no. <laughs> I hope he'll be talking about the, the morality of uh, border protection in terms of protecting life at sea. So that's my little <coughs> spiel. Thank you all for coming. Um, what time at Paper Chain? Uh, good question. Six o'clock. Uh, 5.45, get gathering, 6 o'clock starting. Uh, politics in the pub is always a, a great occasion, and uh, I'm very glad to have been able to facilitate and help Richard Dennis tonight. Thank you all. And thank you, Frank Brennan.